What's up my friends, Dustin Stelzer with Electrician U. Today we are going to install a mini split. Today's job is uh, installing the wiring for a mini split. So the AC contractor, I do a lot of work with them. They're gonna come back and actually put the mini split in. So all I need to do is get a disconnect in the area and then go, you know, hook it up to a breaker essentially. So what I've got is just this little area. They're gonna put the mini split like right here. So I just need to get a disconnect top right of that and then they're gonna whip into it later. So I'm gonna just gonna run conduit, probably put an LB there, run a three quarter conduit all the way down underneath this whole entire ceiling. There's no access because it's between floors. All of the uh, panels are upstairs. So once I get over here, I've got to transition and go right up by that window and get up into the eave up there and then try to get a hold of that and go over to an electrical panel that's inside uh, a closet over there. So it shouldn't be all that difficult, just kind of a pain in the butt once we get upstairs, but there's really no other way. Like they've got some uh, panels that are like downstairs in the basement. There's no way to get up over in this area. None of this ceiling is accessible. So like I can't get, you know, in there to like crawl around. So uh, the easiest thing to do is to put pipe. So that's what I got to do today. So the first thing that I had to do is mount the disconnect where it was going. I had to mount that first because I had to take a picture and send it to the AC contractor and just make sure that it was where he wanted to put it and that there was enough room and everything. So I started on that end and then I had to run conduit all the way up on the ceiling. I'm using LLs, LRs, and LBs, uh, which are conduit bodies. And I'm actually using all three of them on this job, which is a little rare, um, but I'm using an LR on the far end of the conduit where I'm transitioning from horizontal to vertical going up into a soffit. I'm using an LB that's in the very center um, where I'm transitioning around a tight corner and then I use an LL at the actual disconnect for the unit. For those of you who don't know those terms, it's basically a, uh, a small conduit body. So we call a conduit body kind of like a transition junction box looking uh, conduit raceway thing. <laughs> it's got a removable cover, not meant for like twisting joints and putting actual joints in. It's more meant for uh, having a pull point uh, in between two different things. So instead of trying to like bend this crazy 90 and have like a weird crazy 90 going around the corner that stuck out, I was like, no, nah, let's just hug the corner really tight. We'll put the LB, you know, on one side, we can do an LL and LR and just make everything really tight and straight. I got all of my conduits strapped. I did strapping probably about every four feet or every five feet. Um, you don't have to do that per code. Electrical metallic tubing. We're gonna be in 358. That is what I ran. Uh, 358.30 specifically is the securing and supporting section. EMT shall be installed as a complete system in accordance with 300.18 and shall be securely fastened in place and supported in accordance with 358.30 A and B. A is for securely fastened and B is for supports. So we're not running along any supports. We are securely fastening this to something. So it says EMT shall be securely fastened in place at intervals not exceeding 10 feet. In addition, each EMT run between termination points shall be securely fastened within three feet of each outlet box, junction box, device box, cabinet, conduit body, which is what these LBs, LRs, and LLs are, or other tub tubing terminations. So it says basically any uh, where, where we have these conduit bodies within three feet somewhere, I have to have a strap. I have to have it securely supported. And then within every 10 feet, I can't make my strap go over 10 feet. Can you strap more than that? You know, like every foot? Yeah, absolutely. Code is only the minimum. So you can strap as many times as you want. I often think once every 10 feet is kind of a weak method of, of securing and supporting. It is the minimums, it's okay. I just kind of like doubling that up a little bit. Every five feet is my preference. Now for this job, I wanted to get all of the conduit up 
the quantity up as quickly as I could before I started doing any kind of crazy bends or offsets or anything. I always like to do that last. Um, just because if I under ordered conduit, I would rather know that ahead of time and just try to get everything up as much as possible. And then if I have to make a trip, I'm probably going to be going out and getting lunch at some point. So like it makes sense while I'm going out to go get materials. So my kind of methodology is I like to do as much work and try to get the quantity of stuff done so I can get a material count when I leave for lunch rather than trying to mess with these little kind of weird projecty things and things that are going to be like a constant change. I like to just get into a flow early on first thing in the morning. So that's what I did. Um, you notice that I'm using a Milwaukee reamer. So this is a new tool. This is actually the first time I've gotten to use this. But Milwaukee makes this uh, little conduit reamer. Um, so it does half inch, three quarter and one inch, just like the majority of the reamers out there. It also has this lanyard attachment and it's got the flat head on one side like we all like. Um, what I noticed about it is it's a little loose. Like it doesn't, a lot of the other brands like Klein, you stick them in there and they fit solidly. Uh, this Milwaukee was just kind of like wobbly and loose. Still did a great job. I have no problems with it. I don't know if maybe it's just kind of a different design and so I'm not used to it yet, but I did get to use that. Also, one of my favorite tools in the world to bring out is my bandsaw. I've got a portable bandsaw. I've got a couple different ones, all the different sizes, all the different battery configurations and everything. Um, but I use this compact one, not the subcompact, the uh, the actual, like, I guess you would call it the average size. It's not the big size where you can fit four inch conduit. This one fits two inch. So I keep this thing on me everywhere I go. I'd rather be doing this than getting a sawzall out and trying to sit and cut that with, you know, a sawzall blade. The next thing that I did was uh, finish the conduit run um, on the side of the building that the actual um, unit was going to be hung. So I finished running that conduit, got the LL put in place, used a close nipple and some lock rings to get everything in place. Uh, and then got that ready for the wire pull. Then once I got all the conduit up in place, I ran the lower section of my conductors first. So uh, I got to use this brand new um, fish tape. It's a battery powered fish tape by Milwaukee. And this thing is so cool. You can use it and pull a trigger and just allow it to feed down the conduit or you can just use it to feed slack while you're pushing down the conduit. Either way works just fine. Then I moved down to the complete other side because where the end of our long conduit run was, I had to 90 up and go up a wall, past a window, up into an eave and actually get a hold of the uh, the conductors up in an attic and then change over from THHN, which I'm running through this entire conduit run, to Romex, which goes across the, the wood structure and then into the panel where they've already got Romex run everywhere else throughout this occupancy. So once I got all of the conductors in the bottom portion, all I had to do was close up all of my conduit bodies and uh, put the, you know, the weatherproof covers on and then land my conductors on the lied side of the disconnect. So I was providing a disconnect. I was hooking the line side wires up and the AC contractor said that he was going to come behind me and whip out of it and, and actually hook up his own equipment. So I didn't have to worry about any of that stuff which was dope. So everything down below outside was finished. Last thing that I had to do was just finish getting the THH up to the top to a junction box that I had installed um, and then change over to Romex. So now I went inside, uh, I had to go upstairs into this little closet. It was like a janky little mechanical closet sort of with a panel like down at foot level. <laughs> and it was just, I could tell this was a handyman special. You know, there was a two inch PVC mail adapter in the top of this panel and they're just running all their conductors. So you could sit and pull on the conductors. Um, so I wasn't gonna like do anything with that. That was all their janky special. Once I got the Romex run up in the attic and got it down, I took my own path, stapled my own stuff, kept it separate, put a brand new Romex connector in. So it was secure, did everything, you know, correctly, I suppose. Um, and then I just had to open it up, put a brand new two pole 20 in. This is just a 240 volt system. So I've got two unground conductors and a lot of you are probably already busy commenting about how I'm re-identifying my white conductor as red. You're like, no, you can't do that. You can't field identify if it's not number four or bigger conductors. And is that true? So can I take a white conductor and re-identify it red? Let's see what code says. You get two code times with this episode. So how many of you think that you can only uh, re-identify 
re, you know, tape field identify conductors that are number four or bigger. How many of you think that applies to all of the conductors or just the neutral? Let's dig in! <laughs> okay, so 200.6 means of identifying grounded conductors. This is just talking about the neutral. We've gone over in other videos, we've done this whole code time thing enough times that we've covered this already. And then under 200.6b, it does say at the time of field installation that we can uh, identify a neutral conductor or a grounded conductor with white tape. But anything smaller than that, number six or smaller, you cannot field identify. Uh, meaning you have to actually install like number six or number eight, number 10, a white conductor. This is for the neutral. So what does it say about ungrounded conductors? Can you re-identify uh, re ungrounded conductors? And it does, it says in 200.7, specifically using a grounded conductor and re-identifying it to make it an ungrounded conductor, there's a code for that. Use of insulation of a white or gray color or with three continuous white or gray stripes. Part C is circuits of 50 volts or more. And what it says, the use of insulation that is white or gray or that has three continuous white or gray stripes for other than a grounded conductor, so for an ungrounded conductor, for circuits of 50 volts or more shall be permitted only in one and two. Number one, if part of a cable assembly that has the insulation permanently re-identified to indicate its use as an ungrounded conductor or by marking tape, painting, or other effective means at its termination and at each location where the conductor is visible and accessible. Identification shall encircle the insulation and shall be a color other than white, gray, or green. It also goes into, if you're doing like switch loops, how to handle situations like that, and then flexible cords in number two. So the answer to the question is yes, you can. And it doesn't matter that it's only number 12 conductors that I'm running. It is a white conductor that I'm re-identifying from a grounded conductor to an uh, ungrounded conductor. So at each point along the system where the wires are accessible, and visible, you need to identify it as such. Now, there were some crazy things in this panel. Um, <laughs> I noticed all of the grounds, none of the grounds are actually touching each other. So they're using the panel as a way to connect each one of the grounds to each other. And then they like put like three or four number 12s into one lug, which, you know, it's not listed for that. So that's not okay to do either. Um, and then they put these like two inch uh, uh, pop in bushings as their means of like all of the conductors coming into these panels. There's nothing strapping them, holding the conductors, at least on the top, the few conductors that came in had some staples in them. So like within 12 inches of the enclosure to code, they are stapled, um, but this is not okay to do. And then they left like, there's just all kinds of crazy conductor underneath this panel. So it was a nightmare. This is way out in the middle of the sticks out in Texas somewhere. Um, there's a lot of places way out in the sticks in Texas somewhere that look very much like this. This actually wasn't too bad compared to a lot of stuff I've seen. But uh, I wasn't there to fix uh, old Randy the Handyman's shit. I was just there to fix my own. Uh, so I put a brand new two pole 20 QO breaker in, labeled the panel and put everything back together and uh, went through and tested. I turned everything on, went and tested, make sure that I had good power before I left because I didn't want a service call to go drive an hour away to come back because I messed something up. So just verified that I had power and uh, left everything in the off position because I knew an HVAC contractor was gonna come out behind me and I didn't want them opening something up, some green helper just reaching their silly hands up in there and getting electrocuted. Um, so I made sure to leave everything off and then I told the AC contractor I let everything off and I put the handle of the disconnect in the off position and that's how I left it. And then I just cleaned everything up and got out of Dodge. So that was a pretty good job, um, a very simple job to do, something I could do it by myself, and it made a really decent amount of money for one day, and it didn't even take me a day, it took me like four hours. Um, and that was with me moving cameras around to try to fill this stuff for y'all. So it was like wasting a lot of time. And then the pastor would come out and talk to me for like 20 minutes, which is cool. He's a really nice guy, but it's like, bro, I'm trying to work and I'm trying to film and I'm trying to not waste time. Um, so it was a nice, easy little job, but I, I love jobs like that where it's like I can come in in a few hours, make a whole bunch of money, do a bunch of stuff, and then get out rather than having to be something that's like 
drawn on for you know eight hours a day for multiple days at a time. So let me know what you guys think. I have another video that we'll probably do of a mini split, but in a residential situation. So very similar to how uh, we would do something like this, but a little bit different. So that'll be coming up in the near future. Make sure you hit like, make sure you hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, lets you know every time we're gonna do an episode, join the channel membership. You can get a hold of me, get my phone number and ask me all your silly electrical questions. Uh, love you crazy people and I'll see you in the next one. Best Camp Music and Video.